I think it's important that, they ex that people accept an abduction for what it is. Because so I, I have met people at various UFO uh, symposiums and things who deny the fact that they were abducted. Even though all those telltale signs, you know, you can read them off. They may say this, they may say that, but, but they go through denial. So they have to want to help. And, and, and that only begins by accepting what has happened to you. Can we deny an abduction and be a contactee? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Uh, but that's, that's, it has, that's where it has to start. They have to accept what has happened to them, and then they can move on to, uh, to get some help. See, I think the word abduction, it, it means to be taken against your will. It's a negative concept word. Mm -hmm. And I feel that there's a lot of negativity and a lot of victimization of the contactees simply because someone, I mean, all right, you, you're walking along, you, you meet some uh, beings, they take you on your ship, and they bring you back. Well, you're kind of going through the natural trauma reaction, which is a normal human reaction to any abnormal event. And you don't really know what you feel. And they come up and they say, my God, you were abducted, you know, as opposed to saying, you just had a contact experience. And the negative, negative influence of abduction, captors, I mean, the whole thing puts a real negative victimization aspect on the whole phenomena that isn't really necessary. Bill and I have had this discussion about six uh, times, you know, I we think, go, we go back to the floor. were you contacted <laughs> or, or, or were you abducted? You know, I've been... I was taken, for sure. <laughs> there you go, that's better than being abducted. But uh, it felt like I was abducted. <laughs> in the Bible, particularly in uh, the letter to the Thessalonians of St. Paul, there's a description of what is supposed to happen uh, at the time of the Second Coming, when the, Jesus returns. And uh, the description in Thessalonians uh, is sometimes called uh, the rapture, you know, the word. And so that it is said by St. Paul that at that moment uh, we will just be taken up into the clouds to meet the Lord at, that, at the moment of, of, the, of the second coming. And uh, it seems to me that you could properly describe uh, modern abduction experiences as in some sense fulfilling or fitting the description of the rapture. However, the word rapture has an ambiguity about it. Uh, the Latin word, Latin root of the word raptus means literally lifted up, carried away. And the word rapture has the connotation of ecstasy. When we say we're carried away, I was ecstatic over the experience. That's a positive experience. That would be stressing the positive aspect of the rapture. But the word rapture is also related to the word rape or abduction. That's the negative side. And uh, so it seems to me that both aspects of the raptus, of the rapture, are represented in modern uh, ufological experiences. I've always been interested in UFOs my whole life. Um, I live in Buffalo, Wyoming, and in 1983, Dr. Leo Sprinkle came to give a workshop on UFOs, and I attended that, and about four days later, I started having recurring dreams of a recurring dream I had as a child. The dreams of being in a boomerang-shaped airplane, um, being in a round airplane, and, and uh, three years ago I came uh, to the conference here in Laramie, and Dr. Sprinkle regressed me to find out about these uh, dreams I had. I was abducted just, it was just, just about a year ago, uh, last July. Um, I was on a camping trip up near Reno, Nevada, alone, I was camping alone and had gone into the city of Reno to uh, try to make some money. <laughs> and uh, as I approached my car, it's around 11.30 at night, as I approached my car, which is parked on the street, a group of people, a cluster of people, was walking toward me. And as I got just about up to my car, I could tell that these people were walking in unison. I thought that was a bit unusual. and. Uh, I sort of, I began slowing down, 
And at, they were about approximately 15 feet away. I realized that these were not real people. And at that point, I said, run. And of course, at that point, I was, I was paralyzed. I couldn't, I couldn't move. My first conscious knowledge of an experience was at eight years old when I lived in Alaska. I was getting out of school, and I saw a moose on top of the hill behind the school. And I said, oh, great. So I decided to go check the moose out. So I went up the hill, and there was no moose, but there was a round airplane. For an eight-year-old, you know, it was an airplane at that time. Um, I don't know how I got in the craft. It was a small craft. Um, the seats were small to fit my size as an eight-year-old. And there wasn't anybody around. I heard footsteps. And I thought it was my mother because I didn't walk home from school right away. I should have. I remember briefly they were eight feet tall. They had black robes and they had hoods on, but I never saw their faces. But I do remember that they grabbed me by my arms with these like spider-like fingers and they escorted me to the ship and they, they held me firmly so they would let me know that I wasn't going to be able to get away if I wanted to. It was more like I had to go. It was my turn. And they told me it was my turn and I was so afraid. I was very afraid. It was a small being that appeared um, telepathically communi communicated to me that uh, everything was fine, not to worry. And he took me to a seat that had lights above it. These were different colored lights shone the lights over my head and uh, communicated to me to remember the lights and repeated that a couple times. And then he took me back to the front of the uh, ship and took me up into space. And it was beautiful. It was just gorgeous. I didn't want to come back. It was circular. I, I just remember compartments. I remember them shuffling me from rooms to rooms. I remember them um, laying on a bed and there they were doing an operation on me and I remember this lady who's been in my life apparently for quite some time uh, she was standing to my left and there were two two men they were men for some reason I know I knew that they were men doctors I, I, I would imagine they were operating on me and uh, she kept telling me to look just look in, look into my eyes and everything will be okay the abductees are persons who are terrorized, traumatized by the appearance of the entities, whether they meet them out in the open or are standing at their bedside in the middle of the night to, you know, to transport them aboard a ship. And uh, the terror and the trauma uh, continue even after they are, are brought back to their home. And uh, the abductees display all of the symptoms of a disease or an emotional disorder which is described by psychiatrists as delayed stress syndrome. If there's any trauma, going back and living it through hypnosis and actually getting a hold and knowing what happened often relieves the trauma, often takes it away. I think, I think the hypnosis session when I took it Several months after I was adopted, at the time I didn't even believe it myself, but after the hypnosis it helped me uh, relax more and understand myself. In just a moment, we're going to witness an unusual experiment. Dr. Leo Sprinkle from the University of Wyoming is going to hypnotize a young man who had an early childhood encounter with a flying saucer and a creature from another world. Now, in order to help him more perfectly reconstruct his memory, Dr. Sprinkle is going to attempt to return the man to the age of eight when the encounter occurred. And we're not quite certain what's going to happen here this afternoon, but one thing is for sure. You're not likely to forget it soon. Okay, Morris, as we discussed previously, you'll be able to relax deeper and deeper, faster and faster, letting the entire body relax deeper and deeper, letting the toes and feet, ankles and calves, knees and thighs, hips and torso, hands and wrists, arms and shoulders, neck and head, letting the entire body relax deeper and deeper, being able to go back in time, back to the experience, being able to talk and describe your reactions to the experience. 
and seem to descend rapidly. And it appeared that it had landed on the far side of the wood from us. We were amazed at what we'd seen. We couldn't believe it, hardly. We noticed as we looked up, and even after it had landed, there seemed to be something little, like particles falling from the sky. It reminded us of light snowflakes, but not not as real. It's just, you could almost see through them. As we got closer, Roger and Eric saw him pointing something at us. And we, we all began to feel a tingling sensation. Not real intense, but all over. And this began to frighten us. First impression was like a midget. He was completely in a, a uniform or a, what is like the spacesuits I've seen on TV. He had a helmet and the suit was white. The helmet was white and it had something over the front, over the face. It looked very much like a person might have looked. In a few moments now, you'll be returning to the normal state, coming back from that experience, back to this time and place, feeling fine and feeling good. If you wish, you can just count mentally from one to five, counting from one, two, three, coming more and more to the normal state, feeling fine and feeling good. Four, now wide awake at five, wide awake and feeling fine. day after, remember everything that they did to you, you might wind up committing suicide or taking a leap off of a bridge, wow. and maybe by it slowly filtering out through hypnosis, it's, a, it's, it's like uh, taking a, a safety lid off very, 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 very slowly, instead of just ripping it off and letting it, you know, take off. How could I handle it as an eight-year-old? There's just no way. I think a lot of people are terrified of the idea that they of what's behind that, that missing time. And what often happens is they find good experiences and benevolent beings. And it's just getting over that initial fear of not knowing and, and I'm afraid of what I'll find and coming to terms with yourself and say, I need to know, I need to know for my own mental health. I'd like to see the scientific community to begin to seriously study this phenomenon. Uh, many of them have been intimidated because uh, they're afraid of being ridiculed by, uh, for, for studying a, a quack field, as it's been labeled sometimes. Uh, I think it's because it's only through, you know, our scientists getting involved and that, we are, that we're ever going to get to the bottom of it, I think, really. I mean, it's, uh, it's gone on too long where they just totally ignore all this hard evidence, people with marks, people who have all kinds of problems, uh, I think it's time that they stop playing games and, and got involved to help us, because we need it. <laughs>